Hello, and welcome to a video on Hacks to Play if you're developing a hack. I've been thinking about this, and a couple folks who I work with in Discord were like, dude, you should make a video where you talk about things that you recommend playing to people who are building stuff, and why. And I was thinking about it, and I was like, yeah, let's do it. So, I put this together the other day, and I thought it would be fun to share. My recommendations for hacks you should play if you're interested in developing a hack. So I do want to talk a little bit about what is in this video. And again, the list I'm about to share is six hacks. I think these are, if you're going to pick six hacks to play for research and learning, these are the six. And I think that they're going to be good if you're interested in making a hack. And I'll talk a bit about why as we go through that list. And you'll also be able to learn some hack history and get a feel for different styles of gameplay through the ages. So there's a couple of different dimensions I'm thinking about when I put together this list. There's fairness, there's gameplay, there's aesthetics, there's technical limitations, there's era or objective that the hack is trying to achieve um, through the story and gameplay and like how they approach it can be slightly different. So it'll be a pretty good sample size. And again, this is not my favorites, but I think if you came to me and said, Dan, I wanna make a hack, but I want some examples from what I can learn from, this is what I would recommend. And again, this list isn't necessarily to say these are the best hacks, you should do exactly everything that they do. If you did that, I think that's a bad idea. What I'm saying is that there are going to be aspects of these hacks that are good that you should want to emulate. There are going to be aspects of these hacks that are not great that you should avoid. And experiencing them as a player will help you avoid those mistakes. But it will also help you appreciate kind of how far things have come. And also give you some ideas for objectives and how you might handle it. One thing that I've really enjoyed about playtesting so much and doing this YouTube thing is that it gives me an opportunity to really see a plethora of hacks and work with different creators with different goals. And I think that it's helped me sharpen my own feelings on map design and gameplay design and fairness and so forth. So let's talk a little bit more about what this looks like. So first off, obviously, if we're gonna recommend any hack to an aspiring HackRom developer, because again, what I would recommend to someone who's making a hack is different than someone who's just gonna pick up and play a hack. If you're making a hack, the last promise is always a great starting point. I don't think this is a controversial opinion. Um, it's one of the earliest hacks released in 2012. There is a lot of love put into it. And for me, what I always find most impressive about the last promise is just how much stuff is in it, given the difficulty of hacking at the time. And what you can learn from The Last Promise is, you know, you can learn a lot of things. You can learn just how things were different back then. You can learn a little bit about, you know, making a game have a specific feeling. Like, I think anyone who plays The Last Promise, like, it leaves an impression. And part of that is, like, the way Blazer wrote the characters, the way he wrote the story, the names and the descriptions of things like TLP has a very distinct aesthetic and mood to it that I think in addition to it just being like one of the oldest hacks just like helps it really stand the test of time and it's something that we all kind of still marvel at in a lot of ways it also has a post game which is impressive I think it's just like a great starting point to show you what's possible now it's not to say TLP isn't perfect for me I played the last promise and this was actually what motivated me to start hacking again was I was like, the gameplay here, by and large, forgettable. I didn't really care very much for the gameplay. I thought it was kind of slow. I thought a lot of the maps just were like too long. Um, and it was a lot of just like choke the point with Kevin and like watch the weak enemies die. Um, and that's partially because of when the hack was made and that gameplay and like being more player phase oriented like wasn't really in fashion then. Like this was made, you know, FE7 was still like relatively new um, and at this point just like having more FE7 was still pretty novel so consider consider that for a moment but I played the last promise and I was like if this is 
hailed as like the best ROM hack of all time, like I can probably make something. And that wasn't to like diss Blaze or anything. I think everything about this hack is great. I don't think the gameplay is spectacular, but I do think it's a great place to learn and find some motivation. Like this is the most famous hack. And if you can find flaws with it, and if you can find things that are good about it, it I think is really inspiring and just kind of shows how accessible the hobby is. So I would say this is really good for someone who's like interested in learning the lore of hacking, interested in understanding kind of what started it all, interested in, in seeing like some of like the crazier stuff you can do with like events and secrets and all that. You know, you'll get a bit of things about like fairness and unfairness and like communicating information to the player. Um, and you'll get a sense like, do I like this gameplay? And if I don't like it, then what would I do differently? And I think that that's an important conversation to have. So that's the last promise. Always think it's a good wreck. Second, the Sword of Heaven and Earth. So I haven't finished my LP yet as of this recording, but I feel pretty confident that this is one I would recommend to an aspiring hack creator. And there's a couple reasons why. One, look at that title screen. Isn't it a sick title screen? But two, what I like about Sword of Heaven and Earth, and especially being part of the English-speaking hack community, is that right now there's no translation. Only a menu translation by Curb. That was put together very quickly. And it's really interesting playing this and seeing how well you can communicate things to the player without words. And assuming just like the natural, the love language of Fire Emblem, as I like to call it. Can the player understand what's going on? without playing, without re being able to read the hack. And I think that's really important. And it's important how much you can telegraph these things. Obviously, some things are going to be harder to telegraph with it, without dialogue, and I've definitely struggled through it. But it's interesting to see how much can be done without it. And just making it really clear. I think it's a really interesting test to see, like, you know, how is a hack developed in Japan? Um, how is... How are things being communicated to a non-Japanese speaking audience? I think it's really interesting from that lens to look at. The other thing I really like about this hack is, you know, the unit design and balance. This hack front loads your units, and I think it gives a pretty good sense to a player of like, this is how you make an Iron Man friendly game that's engaging. Like, I've played through chapter 21 at this point. Well, really only until recently did I feel like there was a difficulty spike, but for the most part, like the game has a pretty smooth difficulty curve and you get a ton of units and it's not too hard to like pick some unit off the bench and get them up and running pretty quickly and i think that's really important for an iron man game and i think this game does a nice job of illustrating that at least through its early part i'm kind of getting into the final stretch where things are getting a little bit more challenging and, and locked in it's probably a little less fun to to lose a unit at this point but overall i think it's a good some good lessons here of course the other things to consider too is like some of the units just like are completely outclassed and it kind of shows like you know it the flaws of like the vanilla like fe1 fe6 style unit design where like some units just are straight up better than others in very obvious ways and that's really not that fun but overall how do i enable the player to be able to iron man this is a pretty good hack to answer that question in my opinion and again, there's things you can learn from and improve on it. Like, I definitely would lean more into, like, distinguishing different units, for example. And I'll talk more about this when I finish the, the run, but I think this is one worth playing for communication of information and just high-level, like, thoughts about unit design. I don't think it's the best unit design, but if you want to make something Iron Man friendly, this is a good hack to look into for that. Um... And also just like some funky objective ideas. There's a lot of cool objective ideas in this hack that all just use vanilla systems. Nothing really super crazy custom. It's all just manipulating what's already in the ROM, which I think is always really exciting to see. Dream of Five by Astro Luna Soul. I'm not going to talk too much about that. I did a whole video on why I think you should play it. The short of it right here is that the game is... I, I find this game just absolutely alluring. But I also find that it's incredibly unfair and punishing. And when I get frustrated as a player when I'm playing this, I think to myself, like, how do I avoid making my players feel the same way? At the same time, it's also just, like, gorgeous to look at. And so it's very pleasant. 
but I think it's really important to play to learn kind of just like a bit about like what not to do in certain cases, but also like how much aesthetics and good character writing can carry. And it certainly helped me shore up in those regards and reprioritize accordingly. So Dream of Five, love it. Go watch that other video I did. Um, another one, Bloodlines. So Bloodlines, unfortunately, doesn't have a public release right now. Um, I happen to have an old patch lying around from like 2015. But I think Gas took down the patch, which is understandable because he's working on some updates. I was skeptical to include this here, but there's enough footage on YouTube. I think Snake Mom Melissa has a really great LP of Bloodlines. I'm sure you can find others elsewhere as well. What I love about Bloodlines is that it shows how you can use Fire Emblem to create something totally different and distinct. Like Bloodlines, if nothing else, it is distinct. There's so much effort put into the custom animations and the custom monsters and the units and the palettes. There's just like, it just oozes effort. And it also, and I think which is more applicable to the average hack creator is just interesting objective design and side objectives and how it approaches these things. And like one of the things I really like about Bloodlines is that no map really feels like filler. And while I may be in the camp that like I'm okay with some filler here and there, like I like a nice breather map, I like maps that, you know, kind of just like don't do anything super crazy but just execute on the fundamentals really well. Bloodlines has a different approach in my opinion where every map it's like there is some type of distinct gimmick that helps it stand out. And I'll say this as someone who hasn't played much of Bloodlines recently, I could probably tell you a bit about every single map that I played, and I can remember map by map, at least like for the most part. Like there's, you know, obviously you have the first map where you get to play as a dog, which is always the stink Dewey there on the bottom left. Um, the prologue map, you know, just a two-unit prologue, it's quick, but then there's the first chapter there, and you can see in the top right you have the two mermen coming in. There's a little puzzle in the top where you have to like put Dewey in a certain space to open the door. There's a lot of dialogue and new characters. There's secrets. Um, there's a couple villages to get that are under threat. There's green units. There's a lot going on. It's pretty distinct. Later on, you know, there's actually maps where you go underwater and there's like these uh, green units that are taking damage and they're a great anti-turtle because you have to go rescue and talk to them to remove them from that. Um, there's another map where the anti-turtle is an earthquake and you have to rush to a boat to avoid the earthquake as um you know the land kind of turns into sea and stuff like that is just super distinct and i think that bloodlines is an important touchstone for people looking to just kind of see again like what's possible with vanilla and creating stuff that's just super unique and memorable um and bloodlines doesn't really do too many things that are crazy with like objective design but how it approaches, you know, making a seize map or an escape map or a defeat boss map super different is really interesting. And how you get there is really key. So I think Bloodlines is one worth watching and studying for how it approaches those things. And also for its aesthetics, it has great aesthetics. Souls of the Forest. There's a lot to say about Souls of the Forest by Skryza. I think one of the things that stood out to me most about Souls of the Forest when I played it is it's a great roadmap for difficulty and how to design difficulty. Specifically in that the game is so fair. I've never played a Fire Emblem game that was so transparent in its difficulty. And as I played it, I think one of the things that motivated me to keep going even when I died and I died and I died is that victory never felt like it was because or rather, my losses never felt like they were because the hack was unfair or sucker punched me. It was me not pl responding well enough to a situation that was laid out right before me. And that would always motivate me to want to go back and try and do it better. Additionally, Souls of the Forest does have really good aesthetics. It's very consistent. All the artwork's by Scryza, all the palettes are by Scryza. Everything kind of follows a set theme, custom menus, custom modular mini box like it's all very nice and like a very clean aesthetic but also on the top right you can see that there's a number of different options and modifiers and you can kind of see like what's possible 
to do like for alternate modes and just making it really com really uh, convenient for the player. If there's one thing I really admire about how Scryza approaches things is that he's always thinking, in my opinion, you know, how do I make this convenient for the player? Even though I'm going to like, you know, break their kneecaps with the difficulty, how do I make it really fair? And how do I make it convenient? And I think that's a really admirable position to take. And I think it's one that gets lost a lot of the time where we as hack developers get really focused on us and not so much on the people playing the hack. So I always recommend Souls of the Forest to people looking to better understand how to do difficulty well, how to better understand fairness and transparency in communicating things to players because I think this hack does a really great job of doing that. And then we have the Heroes We Deserve by Reliable Chair. There's a couple of things here. One, Heroes We Deserve is obviously a very different hack. Some might call it a meme hack, others might call it a parody hack, um, but it does comedy really well. And I know that there's a contingent of folks who like to work on their haha -ha funny meme hacks. And I think the Heroes We Deserve is probably the best of the bunch. I don't even think I probably, it is the best of the bunch. And the reason I think it's the best of the bunch is because it does, its writing is just like done very well. Like it, it, I think it handles humor pretty appropriately. Um, I think that there's enough custom effort into it that really helps sell it, that makes it look more high effort because it is. Chair did a really nice job with some custom map palettes in certain places. He also did a nice job with like custom weapons and just like taking like the conventions of Fire Emblem and just like really like deconstructing and making fun of them. And he uses a lot of the vanilla systems really well, like in the opener, one of the characters is really stoned from an edible weed brownie and he shows up with like status petrified and like that's pretty humorous. Uh, but more importantly and like what I think is most applicable, like not everyone's going to be making a haha -ha funny meme hack, but what you can learn from the heroes we deserve is a couple of things. One, the eventing is excellent. It's one of the best evented hacks I've ever seen and you can learn a lot about like the importance of like good eventing and doing map movement well and just like scene design and setup because Chair just like carefully crafts it so well. And it also has custom music which I think also helps add to the aesthetic. So I feel like the Heroes We Deserve is an ex a great example for someone who's looking to kind of deconstruct the vanilla Fire Emblem formula and also like nail eventing and aesthetics and music. I think the Heroes We Deserve is really worth playing for those reasons. And it just has a lot of like fun designs like in items and stuff like that and like some funny map gimmicks. So you can definitely learn a lot from that and think to yourself like what would I, how can I apply this and like a different setting. For me, like, I'm never going to make a hack like the Heroes We Deserve, but I can certainly leverage some cool ideas that it pulled off well um, and add them to my own work. So I recommend the Heroes We Deserve too. But that's it. Those are the six hacks I'd recommend. If you were to say, Dan, I want to play six hacks to research, I was like, these would be the six I'd recommend. They're all pretty different. I think you'd all want to look at them for different reasons. And there's stuff to learn about each of them. I barely scratched the surface. I think you just need to go experience them for yourselves, whether that's playing it ideally or watching someone else play it. There's a lot you can learn from these hacks. And I think that if you're new to the game and you've only played vanilla and you're like, I want to try making my own hack. These are the ones I would recommend playing and learning from just to kind of see like what's possible, but also like identifying like what is good and bad about them and either emulating or avoiding those things. So, that's all I gotta say on hacks you should play. There's a number of others that I'd recommend for like more like niche use cases. So like for example, like Fire Emblem 404 by Mage Knight 404. It's like one of the earliest hacks. It's a reskin, but it was like, I think he was saying it was like pre-Nightmare. It was like insane how it just like early it was. And it's like a super early piece of hacking history that I think is neat to contextualize yourself with. I personally haven't played it yet, but it's cool that was like that old a um, couple of others that come to mind but are escaping right now sacred echoes is another one that's like you want to see how to do a d make well like look at sacred echoes um, really really cool reimagining of Gaiden and shadows of valentia but yeah there's a there's a number of more hacks i can continue talking about 
but I think if I had to make like a top list of what I would package and sell as a curriculum, this would be it. So I hope you enjoyed. Happy hacking and be safe out there. Thanks again for watching. Let me know what has helped you get better at learning and making your own hack. I certainly, certainly prescribe to like the best way to make a hack is to like play a bunch of stuff and learn from them and kind of figure out the best elements. And that's inclusive of hacks and vanilla. I think vanilla is going to be one of those things where people will have their own preferences and biases. And I think with hacks, you know, it can be a little bit easier to approach them with an open mind because they're new and unfamiliar to many of us. So I hope this list is helpful to you. Uh, don't feel obliged to play it in like any order, but or obliged to play all of them. But you know, if you're thinking about what can I do to research, like look into these and see what you can learn from them and apply to your own work. That's all I got. So thanks again. Be safe. And I will see you next time.